The following episode of the Nursing Australia podcast contains themes which may disturb some listeners. If anything raises concerns for yourself, please chat to someone you trust or reach out to crisis support services that are available by phone. In Australia, that's Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. For listeners of the Nursing Australia podcast in the United States, contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or in New Zealand or the UK, you can reach out to the Samaritans. Links are in the show notes of this episode for these services, as well as a number of crisis support lines available right across the globe. I am Matthew St. Ledger, and coming up in this very special episode, Nursing Australia presents Andrew Denton. This is Nursing Australia, proudly brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association. I've always been curious and I thought pretty engaged when it came to end of life care. Death is a squeamish subject. Uh, This might sound macabre, but uh, like a lot of things, if it's unsavory or uncomfortable, uh, I tend to be all right with it. But in a normal everyday professional interaction, if something carries this sort of unsavory character, perhaps, or societal perceptions of a certain level of taboo, it often goes unsaid. Uh, It's as if stuff occurs, but perhaps we just don't talk about it. Is that really optimizing patient-centered care if if we're not, you know, completely uh, transparent uh, with each other and our patients? I'm not sure that there are any healthcare professionals out there who haven't at one stage or another been deeply confronted by moral and ethical dilemmas, which often intertwine, they hurdle, they crash headfirst into our delivery of the subjective patient-centered care, which we all strive to. As healthcare professionals, end-of-life care, the planning and the provision of it, it's part of our jobs. It comes with the territory. But you do wonder that with the changing legislative landscape, as Australian states and territory adopt similar iterations of voluntary assisted dying laws, uh, Victoria has had it for two years now. It recently commenced in WA. The state of Queensland um, has passed uh, laws to come into effect in the next couple of years. And, And New South Wales Parliament Uh, is debating it as I record this. Are we as nurses prepared? Are we as health professionals confident that we understand the changing laws? What are the implications on our practice? What are your perceptions? What are your experiences? And what's dying well? Now, Andrew Denton has built his profile as a broadcaster and media personality and has an epic radio and television career to boot. He is no doubt one of the most talented media personality Australia has to offer. For the last six years, Andrew's been down the death mines and has contributed greatly, positively, to the VAD conversation in Australia. VAD is here, so let's get acquainted with it. Remember, if you are listening to this episode of Nursing Australia right now on Apple or Google Podcasts, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button and on Spotify, click to follow. And once again, welcome to Nursing Australia presents Andrew Denton. What is dying well, as far as you're concerned? I think uh, there's a the most senior palliative care nurse in Victoria, uh, former Sister of Mercy called now Professor Margaret O'Connor. Um I put that question to her and she said, a good death is the death the person wants. And I thought that was a, a simple way of looking at it. And I, I guess I would uh, extend that by saying, you want to die as close to being the person you are as you've lived. When it comes to voluntary assisted dying or VAD, what do you, what do you think is the public's understanding? And then s- secondary to that, what do you think the broader oh, health professionals understanding of that and are they synonymous or is there a bit of a gap there i know that's a fairly layered question the the way it's most commonly put to me uh and and in the public square is is that simply understood imagery of 
we treat our dogs better than we treat people. Um, so I think people's understanding is, and I think it's quite widespread, uh, that voluntary assisted dying is about not letting people suffer unnecessarily at the end of life. It's as simple as that. Now, um, people have very broad views as to where that should apply. And, and for instance, um, dementia and Alzheimer's is, is the most commonly raised example because it's so prevalent in our mm. society. Um, but yeah, I think that's people's understanding. And, and that is in essence what the law is about. If somebody is beyond meaningful medical help, then why would you let them suffer when we have the means to help them? Um, mm. Within the medical profession, Wow, uh, I, I have been surprised to discover a couple of things. This applies more to doctors than nurses. I had just assumed that this came, that death came with the territory, that doctors were conversant with this, but many aren't. Many are deeply confronted by it. I think it's different for nurses because, uh, not that it's not confronting, but they're right there on the front line. Um, and they're, they are sometimes literally holding people's hands at, at at the end, uh, that's not often a doctor's experience. I was really struck when I first got involved with this. The main reason these laws haven't passed for many years in Australia is uh, most particularly the Catholic Church, uh, who are a very powerful, um, unelected institution in Australia, have a great deal of access to our parliaments, but they've also run a very, very skillful disinformation campaign and fear campaign. However, their most powerful regiment in that campaign have been medical professionals who share mm. their views but who don't represent as representing the church they present as uh as medical professionals and so what i've discovered is that many doctors who oppose these laws actually have almost no idea how they work they have know almost nothing about them they almost know nothing about how they work overseas they just repeat the talking points of oh we can't have this because they can't possibly be safe um and there is now so much evidence, uh, including now from two years in Victoria, which, which disproves that, but they did, they, they're not interested in that inquiry. How, how much do you think that, that plays into that, uh, how big of a chunk, I guess, Catholic or church-led organisations uh, are involved with healthcare, healthcare organisations in Australia? Does that... Uh, massively, massively. Yeah. And, uh, and it's an ongoing problem. I, you mm. know, the passing of the law in Victoria... Um, improved the situation you know but really what it what this conversation is about as as a very wily uh, politician said to me some years back who's long advocated for these laws it's about who has the keys to the medicine cabinet and uh this this conversation you know those who oppose these laws often say derisively oh it's just about people who want control you find it is People want control at the end of life. They don't want to be told by somebody in a white coat, no, you can't have this amount of pain relief. Mm -hmm. um, brackets, because we don't believe uh, in anything other than uh, God deciding these things, but we're never going to tell you that. Um, I think it's massively, and I, I think it's it's a big question for Australia. You know, in, in right now in Queensland, where this has been debated, uh, the proposed law suggests that... Um, uh, healthcare institutions, in certain circumstances, if somebody is seeking BAD and is so critically ill that it, they can't be transferred to a, another place, then regardless of their uh, conscientious objection, then those uh, religious institutions, in those circumstances, must allow healthcare professionals in to assist that person to die, because uh, not to do so would be cruel. And they are pushing back against that and saying, well, this, this goes against all our beliefs and all our precepts. And the people of Queensland and around Australia have, um, it's a reasonable question to ask. Yes, these institutions provide significant services, for, mm. uh, which are excellent. Um, but we are subsidising those services. We're paying for those services. Uh, at what point uh, is it appropriate where we have no other options, where a law allows us access to voluntary assisted dying, for these institutions to say, because they are morally offended, no, you can't access that law. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a very, in a way, cartoons can be very tough sometimes. I did see a cartoon some years ago, I'm paraphrasing it, 
uh, so gee, that's sharp, but it's to the point, and it shows a, a, a doctor in a white coat next to a person in a bed who's dying and, you know, just destroyed, and the doctor's saying, well, here's how it is. I'm afraid your death is going to be uh, long, it's going to be prolonged, it's going to be extremely painful, um, uh, there's really nothing I can do to help you, uh, but I've got to tell you, I, I can't do anything else because it would make me feel bad. And I thought, yeah, that's there's something about that. Um, uh, I don't, I don't believe in a, you know, I, I totally accept and understand the right of an individual to conscientiously object. And at no point does any law suggest that any person should be involved. But I think that is a cool. different thing again to saying to somebody, not only will we not be involved, but we're not going to allow anyone else to be involved. And you mm. just have to stay here and, uh, you know, bugger the law. You have to die uh, the way we think is right. A few years ago, and I, I, I'm sure anecdotes like this, it, I'm sure I know that you've heard similar, but I'm sure it, it does it does come up a lot. Um, I was in a situation where um, there was a patient who was deemed end of life. Um, they had a, the appropriate palliation and um, pathways. They had they were under the care of a palliative care um, physician who's quite senior and had a very clear um, um, directives in terms of, uh, you know, promoting comfort and therefore, uh, you know, we, we should be giving this person morphine every hour to keep her comfortable. And I was in a situation which I certainly wasn't expecting um, because I, I felt I had a bit of a, a sick sense for this, but it, it came sort of left to field. I was on a, on a shift and, and unfortunately, as I'm sure perhaps you've heard, when it comes to end of life and 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 palliative care measures, I, I feel my experience has been a bit of there's a bit of wink wink nudge nudge sort of behavior that goes on because no one wants to talk about it. But I was stuck in a corridor saying, okay, look, can we um, get this this patient some some morphine? And the the, the team leader came on. She said, no, I'm I'm not I'm not signing that out with you. I'm not I'm not doing that. And I was like, well, why is that? She's like, because I. I have a, a moral objection to it. I don't want to be the one. I don't want to be responsible for 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 pushing her over. Mm-hmm. And and I kind of sat there a little bit stung by it. But then I felt like I was I was in, I was a bit stuck then because you know I, I was in a position where I couldn't really escalate it because it's then sort of been insubordinate. But it also surprised me that. Um, you know, somebody who I'd respected and had worked for for a number of years kind of pulled that out. It almost felt at the 11th hour. I guess, you know, that there's, there's one thing about, you know, operating within the law, but then I guess, do you have any advice for, um, you know, health professionals when they're interacting with each other and, and trying to, I guess, navigate, you know, those objections, moral objections, I guess, within their own profession? Is that... That's a great question. Now, I haven't been asked that before. I wish I could say I was surprised by what you just told me. I've heard that so many times. And uh, I'm well aware of deep distress within the medical, within elements of the medical profession about exactly what you've just described. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who feel they are being restrained from helping people they are there to help. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the, the point about a VAD law is that it does put that power and control back in the hands of uh, patients. But not all patients, not all patients, it's not for them or they're not in a position to do it or they don't know about it as we've just discussed. Mm-hmm. So to go to your question, uh, I think the first thing is when I first got involved in this six years ago, this conversation was almost forbidden within the medical profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, 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 a prominent doctor in Victoria called Dr. Rodney Syme, who uh, is mm-hmm. one of the most uh, principled men I've ever met who was publicly challenging authorities. He was assisting people to die in challenging the, someone to put him on trial mm, and he for was decades in, that's right and he was invited yeah. to speak at the uh royal australian college of physicians i think it was and um and then disinvited he was invited to speak on this subject and palliative care and then he was disinvited Whoa. and it caused a real bun fight um doctors i spoke to uh senior palliative care doctors i spoke to and there weren't many that had supported this law had been essentially uh, held back in their careers mm-hmm. or, th- or threatened. Now, I think the now the legalisation of VAD has changed this. And I, 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 the first thing I would 
urge amongst your uh, profession is speak up, speak up amongst yourselves, first of all. If you found, for instance, on your ward or in your hospital, that there might be six or seven nurses with similar experiences, mm. then approach management about it. I truly believe that light is the disinfectant to this problem. Mm. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and um, it's, it's not going to change overnight. Uh, but I do know, and I've seen it happen in the last two years, the, the legalisation of VAD is challenging and changing the conversation in a medical profession about what is patient-centred care. Mm. Uh, there are a whole lot of things bound up in end-of-life care um, which uh, require questioning. The, the provision of futile care. You know, one of the things in, in the Victorian inquiry, parliamentary inquiry, there was a fascinating little note. If, if like me, you don't have a life and you read a lot of those submissions, uh, one of them was... <laughs> from an intensivist uh, called Dr. Charlie Cork, who I think is pretty well known. And he mm -hmm. referred to, they'd done a study of their uh, medical notes at Barwon Health um, at, at end of life care and realized that in less than 5% of those notes, was there any mention of what the patient was feeling or thinking? It was all clinical. It was all yep. from the perspective of the clinician. Um, now I know that for nurses, it, it's often the reverse of that. Uh, so I would, um, that's probably the main note I give you is don't be afraid to speak up now. There are, there are a lot more people in the medical profession who are having this conversation and, mm. um, you know, to, by way of encouragement, one of the people I've interviewed uh, recently is uh, Molly Carlisle, who's um, a very senior palliative care uh, nurse and a bit of a leader in the community who was opposed to these laws. And she has moved and her take on this is uh, how can we say that we believe in patient-centered care and your choices as long as they're cho the choices that we agree with? If that's mm -hmm. what we're saying, then we're being hypocrites. And mm -hmm. I think what she's saying um, and what these laws have allowed is a fundamental shift in the conversation. It doesn't mean that there won't still be people that conscientiously object, nor that they have a right to. But I think... Um, I think it's going to be a slow rising tide. And I think more and more institutions uh, as the medical profession and as patients get educated are going to have to ask themselves the question, how leg legitimate is our claim to patient-centered care? That kind of, uh, I need to add a little bit of a disclaimer in here, but I just wanted to clarify to about obviously the current frameworks laws that are in Victoria prohibit health professionals, specifically doctors from initiating the conversations. And I'm not yep. for a moment suggesting that nurses, healthcare professionals breach low, any of these laws, code or conducts, but it seems awfully naive, and you did, you did touch on this before, that during nursing interactions with patients, given they are so often really intimate, I mean, it's certainly in my experience, or they are more often than not, I guess my question is, how do you suggest that these questions are fielded when, when you know, nurses are... are a face when, when a patient brings it up what what are the referral pathways well uh, i'll come back to victoria in a second in, in mm. western australia and tasmania and south australia that have since passed laws they do allow uh health professionals to initiate yes. the conversation as long as they mention which is an absolutely appropriate all the treatment options mm -hmm. let's talk about palliative care let's talk about pain relief so that's mm -hmm. that's an improvement based on what's happened in victoria I know precisely what you're talking about. Uh, I remember interviewing Coral Levitt, who used to be the, uh, the uh, president of the ANMF in New South Wales. And she talked, talked about just going to the pan room and crying because patients would have begged for help and there was nothing she could say to them. I, I don't have a good answer to that question because the law says what the law says. Uh, it's important that people follow the law. Those safeguards were built in for a reason, even though that one, uh, I don't know any medical professional that thinks it's a reasonable thing. There's no, no. Other, there's no other legally available medical treatment that the medical profession are not allowed to discuss with their patients. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it will be changed. Uh, uh, but I have to argue for the law to be followed. So I don't have a solid piece of advice for nurses in Victoria other mm -hmm. than um, perhaps what I would say, and this might be more practical if I were a nurse in that situation, I would say the next time you speak to your doctor, uh, if you are 
you know, deeply concerned about what's going to happen to you at the end of life, mm. ask them, what are my options? I'm very concerned about what might happen at the end of life. I want to know uh, what I can do about being in control. In researching for this, I spoke to a number of GPs, nurses, um, who, I'm going to stick to GPs for this, who won't entertain the idea of partaking in, in VAD, regardless if there's a legislative framework, not based on any moral objection, but purely because they're afraid of um, sort of litigious blowback. For, uh, in, is, there any, is there any evidence to suggest, I guess, in, in the, the last couple of the, the last two years uh, in Victoria, has there been any evidence to suggest that that's, that's a valid concern? <laughs> no, in fact, it, they've just described the very thing that the law um, protects against. Mm. The, the concern existed before the law. If I give someone enough medication that will hasten their death, and if someone reports me, I could be in real trouble here. You know, the mm -hmm. doctrine of double effect has never been uh, fully tested in a court in Australia. No. So, so it remains an open question. Um, the, the law is really specific. If you follow these steps, and, and it is the most heavily scrutinised part of medical practice in Australia, bar none, mm. if you follow the law, then you have immunity from prosecution. So I coined a term about this many years ago based on conversations I had with doctors who seemed to have very strong views but very little knowledge, which was agnorance, which is a, a cross between um, uh, the arrogance of thinking they knew what they were talking about and the ignorance that they actually had no idea. So any GP that says that to you simply hasn't paid attention to what the law is. The law is there first and foremost to protect the person in the bed, but secondly, to protect the medical professional. And given that patient-centered care or person-centered care, I think is how aged care legislation yes. puts it, yes. um, is such a cornerstone of, I mean, I, I remember in nursing school, that just hammered into you. It's like patient-centered care. Wah, wah, yeah. wah. And I, I, I that, it's funny because, I mean, I've, I've never had any, any opposition to it. For me personally, it just seemed logical. And perhaps that was my own loan experience, you know, having personal experience watching that, being in awkward situations like the one I just described, being, you know, I guess caught in those conversations with, you know, aggrieved family members on one hand, you know, a clinical team who are reluctant to have the conversation. And then it all drags out to seven to 10 days later, you've still got a person, mm. not a patient or a bed number, sitting in a bed waiting for someone to make a decision. And for whatever it was, it, it, it's it, distressing is, is um, uh, uh, you know, I, th I think an, under, uh, an understatement. And, and the, the worst for me, sadly, was, was only, you know, two years ago, not even, and um, had to physically hold a patient down um, while giving him morphine. He was well and truly deemed um, end of life, but for whatever reason, um, had a really, really high tolerance to opioids. Right. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, just the, anyway. When I discovered that a few years ago, that in fact, uh, some people have a reaction to morphine, which ultimately increases their pain response. Mm -hmm. That was like, how cruel can this be? Um, mm -hmm. Look, I've heard it uh, many, many times, both from a medical perspective and from a family's perspective. And, um, and in fact, I interviewed a woman, one of the most articulate people I've ever met uh, when I first started doing this, the former New South Wales Telstra Businesswoman of the Year called Liz Lenoble, who had a rare endocrinal cancer. Mm -hmm. And she described in terminology which every medical professional should listen to actually, she described what it's like to be doped up on so much pain relief that you're incapable of telling anyone that it's not working. And she said it was like being trapped in a psychedelic cube and she was effectively screaming, but she couldn't move. And she said, even at that time, in the midst of this horror, I just couldn't believe that in this day and age, this was happening. And mm -hmm. so uh, this leads to a much broader question, which is, um, and I don't know if it goes back to medical training, I don't know where beginning or end of this answer is, but I, I think the, the idea of person-centered care requires the ability to uh, be clinically empathic, empathetic. Now I do know, and I know we're talking more about doctoring and nursing here, but 
Mm. It's interesting reading books by doctors. One of the things that is in common, they all talk about that moment where they're first cutting up a cadaver and how there is a, it's almost like a, a, a thin wall goes up for them and it's meant to, which is where you can disassociate yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't, I, I don't suggest doctors are dissociative, but I think of necessity, <laughs> they have to, they have to be able to act clinically. And I do get that. We ask extraordinary things of them. But, uh, but I think that has tipped over. And I think there's a power thing in there. And I, I describe it as doctor as God and doctor for God. And sometimes they're the same thing. And sometimes they're parallel things. Doctor as God is the doctor who said, uh, as a very senior geriatrician, Victoria said at an AMA panel in 2016, when the point was discussing assisted dying, and when the point was raised that there was huge public support for this, he said to the guy, well, that's why we're paid $200,000 a year, Bob, so we can make these decisions. So that's Dr. Asgod, um, or a doctor who just in the last couple of weeks said to Queensland politicians, sometimes people need to be protected from themselves. That's Dr. Asgod. And then there's Dr. Forgod, which I was referring to before, which is uh, doctors who believe that really uh, this is God's decision, not ours, and will do anything to defend that. And, um, and then you have that grey area, which is what you're talking about, which is where you and other, so many others have been called, which is the law isn't clear, the doctrine of double effect, which you're probably familiar with. Um, Very, yeah. Yeah, the doctrine of double effect is all about what the doctor thinks. And the doctor can think many different things, uh, mm. including, oh, my God, what if somebody reports me for giving too much pain relief, which may have mm. been what, what um, you've experienced at other times. So uh, without clarity in the law, everybody's in a gray area. Yeah. And, you know, take everything else out, uh, take the need out and take the human suffering out. If there's one thing voluntary assisted dying does, is it brings some regulation to a largely unregulated space. And that's, mm. that's a good thing. I just want to shift kilter a little bit and talk about um, advanced health directions or mm. advanced care planning, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you, you might have seen in, during COVID that there's quite a, there's quite a lot of data um, coming out of the US that's seen in certain states, Western, West Coast particularly, a sharp curve up in the uptake of advanced care planning in younger people. Yes. Um, that doesn't seem to have sort of, I guess, trickled down to Australia. But I, I, I'm curious um, uh, what, what's the question I'm trying to ask? Um, what sort of relationship exists or should exist between advanced care planning and VAD, do you think? I think it's, it's very difficult. And I'll preface this by saying, despite the fact I've been down the death mines now for six years, I still haven't done my advanced care directive. And why is that, Matthew? Yes, why is that? Because I'm not going to die, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone else does, but not me. Right, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I, will, uh, I, I, will, I will get to it. Um, uh, it's been one of the bad things about doing this. And, and I, when I speak to oncologists, I say, does every time you get a sniffle, you think it's nose cancer? And they mostly say, yep. <laughs> so I've become far more uh, paranoid about my health. Anyway, so to go back <laughs> to your thing, I think it, this is a crossover with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. As I said before, that's the, the most frequently raised reason why you would have VAD. Mm. What is the core of a voluntary assisted dying law? The word voluntary. And the Lord uh, insists that you be able to demonstrate that this is your competent and voluntary wish all the way through the process, not just once, but multiple times. In fact, right up to when the pharmacist delivers the medication, they still test you for competency. And the, yeah. the head of the statewide pharmacy service, Professor Michael Dooley, told me they've actually said no to some people at that last moment because they don't believe they're mentally competent. So okay. I think that must remain the core of the law. And so... An advanced care directive, and I, and now I'm siding with the medical professional here because I think, particularly if you're being asked to administer, but even if you're being asked to deliver a life-ending medication, if you can't be 100% convinced that this is that person's uh, enduring and competent wish, then I think that puts you in a really difficult moral position. So while I can understand um, 
and there are plenty uh, on my side of the debate that think advanced care directives should be a part of voluntary assisted dying law. That's not how I see it. I think it's it's very problematic. Yeah, I, I, it sort of, um, I guess, lends into informed consent, which is everything that nurses, I guess, do every day, giving yes. any medication to a patient. Yes. You, if you're not convinced, and I can list <laughs> up to coronial inquiries into when stuff has gone awry, awry because people have, have missed something or erroneously given something um, to someone who wasn't of perhaps state mind and should and were unable to consent, et cetera, and so forth. So I, I can see why it would be, you know, painfully problematic. Yeah, and um, the Alzheimer's dementia thing, that debate's not going to go away. I don't have an answer to it. I, I did spend time in the Netherlands exploring it and speaking to the clinic mm. there that deals with those what they call specialised cases, and, and the guy that ran the clinic, he put it pretty well. He said, because some people with Alzheimer's in the Netherlands uh, do access euthanasia, but they still have to prove their mental competency. And mm. he said, you have to make a choice. You have to choose to leave the ball before midnight. In other words, to opt for euthanasia and, and die before you um, early while you're still mentally competent or not mm. make that choice and drift off into the gray. I think we are relying somewhat on a cultural shift within healthcare. Like they, I, I, you know, it, it just, it's 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 a bit disappointing. I mean, in in weeks leading up to this, trying to you know just talk to people, just just to see the, the, the people's shift in disposition, how uncomfortable people are still to talk about yeah. this sort of stuff, and it, it is frustrating because of course you know you think I try to you know maintain neutrality, and and you know it does get, and maybe it's a sign of the times because I'm just irritated with everything else that's going on, but <laughs> it is like it, it is painful to to. And kind of, yeah. Uh, but but I would, uh, I, I certainly get your frustration. God knows I get that. But I can't tell you how much the conversation's changed in five, mm. six years. I can't tell you how many more medical professionals uh, have come to the barricades. And I have to say, mm. from the first, the, the group that were there four square and did extraordinary work in um, Victoria and South Australia and Western Australia with the nurses. Yeah. Um, and they were, when I first set up Go Gentle, they were the first people I went to. I went to the ANMF and said, um, uh, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Can we work together? And um, so, wow. and I, I get that. And I, I think it's, it's a, the nurse's voice is very important in this debate. If you're listening to this and you're in Queensland and you're a nurse and you support this, please be heard and please be heard now because uh, your parliament's about to debate this. And if it doesn't pass now, it might be 20 years before it comes again. Mm. Sage advice. I, I want to ask, like, obviously the, the debate's um, moving uh, in, in positive steps, but um, uh, have you heard the term eugenic impulse lately? No, I remember the first time I heard it, I was just floored. I had no idea at the depth of the... I didn't laugh, I'm sorry. I've always been struck by those who those who allegedly minister to the angels, always call on our darker ones when it comes to this. Um, mm. As though, uh, you know, it's a bit like the old, he who, who cites the Nazis loses the argument. I, um, almost inevitably, once, whenever this debate comes up, it will eventually get to... Yeah, but we don't want to end up like Nazi Germany where they had eugenics. Mm -hmm. To which I often think, well, if you're worried about that, then we should disband the police immediately because they did terrible things under Hitler. I mean, it's such a... It, but, you know, I it was profoundly... It's fascinating to me to see the... Um, the, the really are parallel universes, that hard core Christian universe, which I don't denigrate. You know, it's very important to those people. Mm. Uh, the issue I have with it is that absolute insistence that it be imposed on everyone else. But anyway, that hardcore Christian universe has an entirely parallel view uh, of the world and how it runs to mm. many who don't share those beliefs. It's, it, I guess we've seen this more and more in America in the Trump years, but it is fascinating mm. to see um, parallel universes existing side by side, each thinking that theirs is the universe. The difference is those of us that don't share those religious faith don't believe in imposing our view on them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you. I think we're out of time, so I'll leave it there and let you get on with your day. Sorry, but... that ended up more as a talk about religion and so on. Uh, no, it's no, fine. I just... And uh, I could, as someone who's scarred from 13 years of Catholic education in regional Queensland, I could, I could, I, oh, I, look, I could talk all day about it. But I, I think there, are, there is so much done in the name of faith, which I think is beautiful and admirable. And, um, mm. but there is, uh, so much done in the name of faith politics, which is, uh, Far from admirable, and in fact, mm. um, has caused untold uh, damage and harm, and um, <clears throat> that's what I rail against. Um, and I, again, I just think the nurse's voice in this conversation has been and will continue to be crucial, even once these laws are passed all around Australia. So, just mm. to go back to where you were, don't be afraid to speak up, because I think you'd be surprised how many people are in the same position as you, and also think, "Oh, can I say anything?" Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate the conversation. I was actually far nice. more frank with you then than I generally am. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. So if you support the idea that we should have a full range of compassionate end-of-life choices and that we need a better conversation around death and dying and patient-centred care, then please go to gogentleaustralia.org.au and there's a link in the show notes of this episode for you to click. If you are listening to Nursing Australia right now on Apple or Google Podcasts, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button. And on Spotify, click to follow. Stay safe, look after each other, and thank you so much for joining us on this very special episode of Nursing Australia. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. For more information, please visit us at www.apna.asn.au. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia.